chapter of the Gospel of John. It is a beautiful chapter, a heartwarming chapter. It's a chapter that shows how much that God loves us. We're his friends. We're his best friends. 11 and 1. Now a certain man was sick. A certain man was sick. The word sick is osthenia, which means weak. And his life is leaving him. His life is leaving him. And uh, Lazarus of Bethany. Lazarus. What does Lazarus mean? Remember? What does Lazarus mean? It comes from Eliezer. It's a shortened form of Eliezer. All right. Now, what does Lazarus mean? Remember? Sister Andini, you remember that one? No. How about you Greek students? Roger. No help. Helpless. Name Lazarus means helpless. Now the name Eliezer means God helps. Okay. Who was Eliezer? Sharon. Um, Abraham's, Abraham's best man. Abraham. That was his number one servant. All right. Eliezer. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister Martha. Mary means what? Sorrow. What? Sorrow. Sorrowful. Bitter. All right, and Martha. What did you say? Martha means what? Precious lady. Lady. Yeah, righteous lady or a precious lady or uh, exalted lady. And her sister Martha. And it was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment. Now, do you remember the two different, there were two different times that Jesus was anointed with ointment. There were two different Marys, weren't there? Who were the two Marys that anointed Jesus with ointment? How many of you knew that? How many knew that the two times? One of them was Mary here. Who was the other Mary? Mary Magdalene, which was a prostitute. She was a high-class courtesan. All right? She was a Jewish courtesan, which has been very famous in history, all down through history. And Mary, who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Now, these girls may have watched each other, these two Marys. Maybe one repeated what the other one did. Okay? Uh, let me tell you a little bit about that. Uh, there's a little bit of custom uh, behind this. First of all, <clears throat> Orientals, these are Oriental people, okay? These are not Western people. These are Oriental in thought. Now, the Oriental people, uh, a lot of the Orientals, they keep all of their fingernail clippings that they, they ever clip from the time they're a baby. Did you know that? They keep some of their hair clippings. Uh, they would keep hair clippings from different times in their life. And uh, also, when they comb their hair, they would save all the hair. These are the women, especially. They would save all their hair and put it in a hair bowl. How many of you ever been to a museum or anything where they have a, out of vanity, they would have a hair bowl with a little hole in it? Setting all the vanity, women would do that, and they would take their hair, even in America, and they would they would uh, weave things out of it. In the movie uh, Josie Wales, the girl in there that was his sweetheart, she wove from her hair. She wove a watch fob and gave it to him. Okay, and this was something that you gave to somebody. At these, but those people, they buried that with them. They buried their most prized possessions. And another thing they, they would do is they would have a cheer bottle, and every time they cried, they would catch their tears at weddings and at funerals. And this was all the joys and all the sorrows of their life, and they would take this vial, and they would bury it in their tomb. Because this represented all these things. How many of you have heard this? How many have you not heard this? Okay. Well, <clears throat> this is what these two girls did. Both of these girls... <clears throat> When they went to Jesus, now they were crying. And so, and re you remember, now Jesus was having dinner both times, wasn't he? All right, he was having dinner both times. And when they had dinner, they had a, a short coffee table about that tall that they laid out in the middle of the room like this. And they would have cushions that they would lay on, and they would lay on their left side and reach out there with their right hand, and they would eat their food. They did not have forks and knives and spoons, and Marilyn would not have been very happy there at all. 
because <clears throat> she's got to have all of those things in every meal. I mean, whether she's going to use them or not, she's got them all out there. Anyway, uh, we went down there to that uh, place where they had the, the jousting and everything, uh, uh, medieval times, and they didn't give her any silverware, and she just didn't like that at all. Well, these people didn't eat with silverware. They ate with their hands. Okay, and they just cook, took stuff out of the bowls. They had a bowl there of them, all, and they would dip in with each other, and they would just dip. You know, that's what they ate back then. Okay, this is before they had forks and knives. That's a later, much later invention. I don't know whether it goes forward or backwards. You got to wash them, don't you? <laughs> you wash your hands. <laughs> Gets taste of it later on too. <coughs> anyway. Mary, these both Marys came up to Jesus from behind him. Now, how would you come up behind him if you're sitting in a chair? How many of you have seen pictures of the Last Supper, the, the beautiful painting? It is totally wrong. Maybe a beautiful painting, but it is totally wrong. That has nothing to do with the Last Supper or Jesus' life. They were laying up to this table, and their feet were out, and Mary, both Marys came to Jesus' feet, and they washed his feet with their tears from their eyes. And they took the tear bottles of all their joys and everything, and they poured that on his feet and washed his feet. The, all the joys and sorrows in their life, they just threw it all away because they found their Savior. And then they took these, they would have these little scarves that would make out their hair that they would bury with them. And they took this most precious thing and they wiped his feet with that. That's the story right there. This is a story of absolute total surrender and total devaluation of everything that they owned or that they called dear to their lives. That's where we are so far now. Whose brother Lazarus was sick. The sisters therefore sent to him saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. Now, if you go back and you <coughs> read into some, uh, remember here a while back that I, that I read to you many historical accounts of Jesus' life. Uh, the Bible is not the only evidence of Jesus as being God the Son, as healing, as raising the dead, and all this kind of stuff. It's not the only one. There are many historical accounts. And in the historical accounts, one of the investigations by Gamaliel, which is a very famous leader in Jewish history. Uh, he interviewed many people, Halal and Gamaliel both. They, uh, they interviewed many people about Jesus' life, and he had two lifelong, well, three lifelong companions, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And Lazarus would go out with him in the uh, according to this account, Lazarus would go out to him in the wilderness and they would stay for days at a time hiking and talking and, 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 uh, and Lazarus being taught by Jesus. Do you understand how close Lazarus is? Closer than Peter ever was. Do you understand that? This is his closest friend. His lifelong friend. Not just from his ministry, you know, when he called Peter and John and James and all of them, when he called all of them out. That was later. That was when he was 30 years old. But Lazarus is his lifelong friend. A few years ago, I did the wedding or the, the marriage ceremony, not marriage ceremony, <laughs> the funeral uh, memorial service of my lifelong friend, Gary Harwell. It broke my heart. I still miss him today. Everything we all shared through our whole lives. Now, this is his best friend, his lifelong friend. Jesus had lifelong friends. This is one of them right here. Every year when their family would go up to Jerusalem, the, evidently they would, they would camp maybe at their home. They would stay with them. According to these historical uh, uh, evidences and, uh, that we have, that's where he stayed. Mary, Martha, and Lazarus were extremely rich. Did you know that? They were wealthy. They had a home there in Bethany, which was a, a beautiful place. Now his best friend is sick. But Jesus heard it. He is, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God. His sickness is not unto death. Now, 
that's we're going to find out that Lazarus died, didn't he? But he's not going to stay that way. But the glory of God and that the Son of God may be glorified by it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sisters and Lazarus. He loved them. This is a fat statement. He loved them. Verse number six. When therefore he heard that he was sick, he stayed in then two days longer in the place where he was. Now, that doesn't sound like you're loving somebody, does it? Run right to them when they get sick. But Jesus has got a plan here. He's got a plan, but it broke his heart. The plan broke his heart, but it was for the glory of God. The plan broke his heart because he saw and experienced the death of his lifelong friend. But he wasn't going to let him stay that way. Then after he said this to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. Now, remember what happened... With in Judea. Before Jesus left Judea, what were they going to do to him? Kill him. He's messing with our religion. Religion. We don't want him. Let's kill him. That's the Jews now. And the disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking, kept on seeking, literally is what it says, to stone you, and you are going to go there again? Verse number 9. Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day if anyone walks in the day? And that's basically how many days of light there are average in, in the year, 12 hours of light. Does he not stumble, but he sees the light of this world? But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. Verse number 11. And he said, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. But I go that I may awaken him out of sleep. Now, when you're very, very sick with an illness, sometimes you can't sleep because you're in so much pain. You're in agony and everything. And finally, when your fever breaks and everything, you just pass out and you just rest, then, don't you? Now, that's what they thought had happened here. You know, this, this is going to be what they thought. The disciples, therefore, said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he'll uh, be saved, literally. It says recover in the the translation but it says he will be saved he'll, his life will be saved that's what it's talking about not his soul but his life will be saved verse number 13 now Jesus had spoken of his death but they thought that he was speaking of a literal sleep then Jesus said to them very plainly Lazarus is dead And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Now, let's see what Didymus says. What's Didymus mean? Didymus. Twin. Thomas, therefore, who is called twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us go, that we may die with him now. I mean, he's going to go back here to where he's a... He's on the hit list. He's, there's a warrant out for his arrest, and he's going to be murdered. And we know, they know all of us. So we're going to get it too. Let's go on back. Let's follow him to the end of the earth. You know, Thomas, you know, doubting Thomas. <laughs> he's also sarcastic at times. And this is Thomas's sarcastic nature, okay? So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. Remember? They hung around the tomb for three days. The fourth day, there was no hope. You know, no hope. <clears throat> now, Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Mary and Martha to console them concerning their brother. It, isn't it funny how religion always, always caters to the rich? Just think about that. Isn't that all funny and uh, coincidental that the... Uh, that religion caters to the rich. Always catering to the rich. Martha, therefore, when she had heard that Jesus was coming uh, to meet him, but Mary still sat in the house. Martha, therefore, said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would have not died. Verse 22, even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give it to you. They knew him, didn't they? They saw all the miracles he performed. Jesus said to her, Your brother shall rise again. He shall rise. He shall stand up. 
And Martha said to him, I know that he would raise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, this is very beautiful, that's the title of this message today, I am the resurrection. I am the resurrection and the life. And he who believes in me shall live and even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? Let me uh, give you a little bit of cross-reference here. When Jesus, comes, when Jesus comes back, what's he going to do? When Jesus comes back, what, he, what is he going to do? When he returns to the earth, what's he going to do? Yeah. He's going to clean house, isn't he? All right. Uh, <clears throat> how many of you heard in Revelation, the 11th chapter, the two witnesses? The two witnesses. Okay. We're talking about the resurrection here. When Jesus comes back, the main reasons he's going to come back for his people, he's going to be a rapture, etc. And then there's going to be a wedding in heaven. And on earth there's going to be hell turned loose. The Antichrist and Israel are going to be really having a good time for the first three and a half years. And then something bad is going to happen. Now, <clears throat> the Lord's going to send two witnesses. And there are two Jewish witnesses, aren't they? According to Revelation, the 11th chapter. And they're going to preach. Did you know that Islam is going to send two witnesses? Everything the Bible does, Islam copies. Did you know that? Who's the two witnesses that, that Islam are going to send? Jesus and Mahdi. Their Jesus, the Jesus of Islam, is going to come back and he's going to tell the Jews that, that, that they are a corrupt people, that they descended from monkeys and pigs, and that they can believe in him or he will kill them. And he's going to tell the Christians he's going to break the cross and say, I didn't die on the cross or anything like that. And if they won't follow Islam, he's going to kill them. All right? Now, their Jesus is going to kill Jews. And it says even nature will cry out that every Jew is going to go and kill and behead all these Jews, by the way. And the rocks that they hide behind and the trees behind they hide, they will say, hey, look here, Marty, look here. There's a Jew behind me. Come and cut his head off. Or there's a Christian behind me. Now, what is the Christian Jesus going to do when he comes back? Right here at this period of time. What's he going to do? He's going to save Israel. He's going to save the Jewish nation. Why? Because he made an irrevocable promise to them. He told Abraham that through his seed would all nations be blessed. That's Jesus. Okay. And that they would be always a people for his namesake. At the end of the tribulation period, there's going to be at least 144,000 Jews that have been saved from the Mati and the Antichrist, or whatever you want to call it. And they're going to go in, and they're going to <coughs> inhabit the earth, and they're going to populate the earth again for 1,000 years. And there's going to be one, only one-sixth of the Gentile nations will be left alive. All the rest of them will have been beheaded and killed and murdered. Every Christian... You go there and you find the Bible in the book of Revelation saying that those that are under the altar of God, they're crying out, those that were beheaded and martyred for the sake of the Lord. So now we've got, and one of the things that the Mahdi is going to prove that he is the, the chosen one, the last Amon, is that he's going to raise the dead. He's going to raise the dead. Except these people aren't really going to be raised. These are going to be demonic individuals coming out of the ground. But they'll look just like people, just like the Bible, copycat of the Bible. Okay. Now let's go back and look at this situation here. False religion never, never gives any leniency to anybody, do they? They're not tolerant, are they? What about the Lord? Just let them be. Let them go on and just go on all their lives. I mean, did, did God ever grab you and drag you down and make you become a Christian? No. But it's not compulsory. 
It is a calling, okay? But false religion always demands worship. It demands worship, okay? Now let's go and see the rest of the story about this resurrection here. I am the resurrection, the life, and who believes in me shall live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And she said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ. You're the Messiah, the Hamashiach, okay? And the Son of God. Is that right? The Son of God. What does that mean? That you're literally generated from God. That you are God. When God generates you, if he brought someone into this world, which he only brought one, that person had to be God because he was from God's progeny, okay, the Son of God. This is Genesis, the fulfillment of Genesis 3.15, isn't it? <clears throat> Even he who comes into the world, they knew that he was going to come into the world. All the Jewish women from the time of Genesis 3.15 thought maybe they could have the Messiah. Did you know that? They, they thought that that was possible. Verse number 28, And when she said this, she went away and called Mary her sister, saying secretly, The teacher is here and is calling for you. <clears throat> These were his lifelong bosom friends. He loved them. And when she heard it, she arose quickly and was coming to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha met him. And the Jews then who were with her in the house and consoling her when they saw that Mary rose up quickly and went out, followed her supposing that she was going to the tomb and to keep on re weeping there some more. <clears throat> 32. Therefore when Mar Mar Mary came where Jesus was, she saw him and fell at his feet saying, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And Jesus therefore saw her weeping. And the Jews came with her also weeping. And he was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled. Verse number 44, And said, Where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And verse number 35, that's what they call the shortest verse in the Bible. What does it say? Jesus kept on weeping. He was crying also. He was crying because of all of their pain. Do you think he was crying for Lazarus? He was going to raise Lazarus. What was he crying? Why was he crying? Have you ever seen anybody cry and you cried with them? That's exactly what's going on here. Those other people were consoling her. They were... Do you know that back at this period of time in history that there were, there were professional mourners? People that would go and cry. and They were actresses and actors. They would go and they'd cry at a funeral. They would pay these people to come and cry. And these people here were crying around them. But Mary and Martha were crying because their hearts were broken. They had lost their brother, whom they loved so much. And they didn't understand a lot of things. Why, didn't Jesus, why wasn't Jesus here? He could raise the dead. Why wasn't he here? Why did he let him die? Now it's too late. He's been dead in the ground. This is the fourth day. Been in there three days already. Now it's the fourth day, okay? <clears throat> and so the Jews were saying, Behold now, he loved him. Oh, he did love him too. We're crying because we're, it's custom. But he's crying from his heart. But some of them said, Could not this man have opened the eyes of him who was blind have kept this man from dying verse number 38 now Jesus therefore again being deeply moved with him came to the tomb now it was a cave and a stone was lying against it did you get to go there Aaron I've been to that tomb also this is the rich man's tomb this is the rich man's tomb there's rich people okay and the stone was lying against it Jesus said remove the stone Martha, the sister of the deceased, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be a terrible stench. For he has been dead four days. He's going to smell. And Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you believe you shall see the glory of God? 
Now, no one before that Jesus raised from the dead had been dead this long. Did you know that? Hmm? This man's been dead for four days. This is the fourth day. So they removed the stone, and Jesus raised his eyes up and said, Father, I thank thee that you hear me, and I knew that you heard me always because of the people standing around, I said it, and they may believe that thou didst send me. I'm praying to you, now I know you know, and we communicate, but I'm doing this for their sake. This is what you call a condescension. What is a condescension? What do you condescend? Do you know what that means? That means you go down on somebody else's level to their level where they can understand. This is what we call a condescension. Jesus was praying to the Father. He didn't have to openly do this, but he did it for them. <clears throat> and when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Now, I've heard many, many preachers say, if he'd have said, come forth, that all the graves would have opened. And that's possible. But he said, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came forth, bound hand and foot with wrappings, and his face was wrapped around a cloth. And Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Many, therefore, of the Jews who had come to Mary and beheld what was done, they did what? They believed. What did they have to do here now? This was quite a deal. Now, no one else had ever been healed of blindness, had they? He had healed a man that was blind from his womb, from his mother's womb. And they said, who sinned, him or his, mother, the, him or his parents? You know, that's all. You know, when we think of sickness, when we think of things in this world, what did they do wrong? You know, it's, it's, that's the idea of these people. If you're rich and you're wealthy, God blesses you. If you're not, you're not blessed of God. You've done something wrong. They held what he had done and believed in him. But since some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them the things which Jesus had done, some of them didn't believe, did they? But where they went? These are tattletales. Tattletales. How many of you like tattletales? Anybody around here like a tattletale? Nobody. <laughs> some of these were tattletales. They went to the other Pharisees, and they went to the Sadducees. They were some of them that didn't even believe in afterlife. Now, can you imagine now? Just think about, you know what a Sadducee is? You know, they didn't believe in the resurrection or any angels or spirits or anything. Of course, they don't believe in life after death. They're sad, you see. Okay? They're sad, you see. But these people don't believe in any of this. They don't believe in this at all. All they are, they only have a religion for a cloak. It's for their righteousness. And there are politicians. They're politically correct. Let's put it that way. They're atheists. And agnostics is what they are. They're atheists. Now the atheists go get the other atheists and say, you know what we saw? That's somehow in the world. This guy was laying over there dead for four days now, and Jesus gets him and raises him up. Now, to me, if I was an atheist, that would make me a no longer an atheist. No more atheism. Did you know that there won't be one atheist in hell? Did you know that? There won't be one atheist and one agnostic in hell. Not one. When they leave this one second after they die, they are believers. I can guarantee you that. They are believers one second after they die. Now, to me, there should have been, there should never been another Sadducee left after the ministry of Jesus because we have proved that things are supernatural. There is life beyond the grave. That really, there are spirits and angels and that here is God the Son that has power over death and life. Okay? Many, therefore, the Jews who had come to Mary believed in him, but some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them the things which Jesus has done. Now let's see what they say. Let's just look at these religious people. <clears throat> This is the ruling society. These are the politicians of the day, okay? Therefore, the chief priests and the Pharisees 
convened a council. What council was this? The Sanhedrin court. Now let's see what's the Sanhedrin court, which is the leadership. Who originated the Sanhedrin court? Where did it come from? Who was, the main, who was the first man in the Old Testament that ever designed the Sanhedrin court? All right. Moses' father-in-law is Jethro, Jeter, uh, whatever you want to call him. He had quite a few names. All right. I think about five different names he was called by in the Bible. He was the one that told Moses to get 70 people. You know, get these 70, get the 70, the Sanhedrin. Men that were what? Beyond reproach, that were believers, that would not take a bribe. I don't think any of these people here fit those requirements that Jethro set down for the original Sanhedrin. Okay? So this man is performing many signs, all right? What are we doing? Well, this man is performing many signs. Verse number 48, I want you to circle this, put red around it, asterisk all over it, whatever you want to do. This is, a, this is the purpose of the heart of the ruling society of his day, Jesus' day. If we let him go on like this, all men will believe in him. And the Romans will come. And they will take away both our place and our nation. We're going to lose our religion and we're going to lo lo lose the leadership of our nation. This is why they want to kill him. Now, had Jesus proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that he was the Messiah? According to all the Old Testament prophecies he had. These are the people that were supposed to be foretelling all of those prophecies to those people that when Jesus came then they would say oh yeah this is the guy we've been taught this in, in the local synagogue that's right he's going to come he's going to heal the blind he's going to the, the lame are going to leap like a deer and run he's going to raise the dead is that what they did or not but a certain one of them Caiaphas who was a high priest that year said to them you know nothing at all. Nor do you take into account that it is expedition. Now this guy here, here is the high priest. Okay? This is Caiaphas now. All right, Caiaphas, the high priest. Caiaphas means depressed. He was very depressed when he, these words came out of his mouth, I can guarantee you. This God took over because he was a high priest. God made him say the right thing, at least for a moment. And then he went, <laughs> washed his mouth out with vinegar or something. Who knows? Nor do you take into account that this it is expedient for you that one should die for the people and that the whole nation should not perish. The whole nation would perish. They would be dislocated. They would be uh, relocated, weren't they, all over the world. It's what we call dispersed. It's dispersion, the diaspora. Now this he did not say on his own initiative or out of himself, but being the high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the nation, and not only for the nation only, but that he might also gather together one children of God who are scattered abroad. Boy, that's a parenthetical statement, people. That's in parenthesis. Here we had a Jewish leader stand up and tell the truth for once. Now, let's see the next thing that happens. Totally diametrically opposed to the truth. You can put another asterisk around this and yellow it out or red it out or whatever you want to do. So from that day on, they planned to gather to what? To slaughter, to murder him. Jesus, therefore, no longer continued to walk public among the Jews. Among the Jews. Who did he come to? He said, I must come to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. They some of them stayed lost, didn't they? Some believed. Some believed, but many. The, the biggest rulers. There were two Pharisees that we know that believed, weren't there? Two of them. Who were they? Nicodemus. 
which was now Nicodemus in the third chapter of John came to Jesus by night with an escort from the Sanhedrin. He was official representative. I mean, people say he slept in there, he'd all this kind of baloney. That's baloney. He came to Jesus by night as a representative of the priest, the Levites, the whole Sanhedrin. He was a representative of them, and he said he was. You read that in Greek. And it'll t show you very plainly that they were, he was a representative of those. And Jesus would talk to Nicodemus, singularly, and he would talk to the whole Sanhedrin in plural to him. We saw this different things from Greek as we looked at that. They planned together to kill him. They kept on planning together to kill him. Jesus, therefore, could no longer walk public among the Jews. These are the people that he came to, but went away from there to the country near the wilderness into a city called Ephraim. And there he stayed with his disciples. Do you think his disciples were in danger also? Absolutely. What did Didymus say? Thomas called Didymus. Let's go back there with him so we can die right along with him. All right. Same thing. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand. It was near. And many went up to Jerusalem out of the country before the Passover to purify themselves. Oh, Do you see the uh, hypocrisy in this? They're going to have the Passover showing how that Jehovah God had rescued them out of Egypt and brought them into the promised land. And now they're going to kill Jehovah the one that rescued them. And they're going to purify themselves. What are they going to do, go do? Take baths. They're going to go dip, be dipped. They're going to go baptize each other. They're going to go baptize each other. Now, <clears throat> baptism is a, not a new uh, practice. It goes all the way back to Abraham as far as we know. Maybe even back to Adam. Abraham, when he was going to circumcise all of his slaves, the men, he took them and dipped them. He baptized them first. They died to their old societies and their old ethnic backgrounds, and they were raised anew, and they were going to be children of God, children and descendants of Abraham. And then he, they were all circumcised, which was a sign of the Old Testament covenant. The uh, cutting the Berit in the Old Testament, the sign of the Old Covenant was the circumcision. The sign of the New Covenant is what? What's the sign of the New Covenant? Hey, kind of idiot, okay. Baptism. All right. But baptism didn't start with John the Baptist. All they had baptistries all around Jerusalem. They would go and they dipped themselves when they go in there into the temple. They had to be ceremonially cleansed and purified. If you go to that Dome of the Rock there in Jerusalem, you'll go out there and outside of that, all of these Muslims go out there and there is a uh, place where they wash their feet and their hands and their face. And they purify themselves before they go into that mosque. And the mosque is called what? What does mosque mean? Anybody know what mosque means? That's a place of kneeling place they kneel and kneel in worship kneel in worship well they're going to go through their false religious system also they're going to be they're going to be murderers but they're going to be uh, religious murderers the law as we studied in uh, in Hebrew from the uh, book of Exodus we Elishamo it doesn't say thou shall not kill does it what does it say they shall not keep on killing. It doesn't say thou shall not lie. What does it say? Thou shall not keep on lying. It doesn't say thou shall not covet, does it? What does it say? Thou shall not keep on coveting. It doesn't say thou shall not kill. It says thou shall not keep on killing. The murderers. They're going to purify them. How are you going to purify your... You can wash on the outside all you want to. 
how are you going to wash the inside? How are you going to wash the way? How does God wash your insides? How does he do that? You call upon him, you repent, you believe that Jesus Christ came and he, and he saved your soul and he gives you a new mind, doesn't he? Gives you a new mind. And you are a new person after that. You are re you repented your sins, you're a new person. God cleans you up from the inside out. And then the inside, what happens to the outside when the inside gets changed? Jesus said, clean the inside of the cup. Don't worry about the outside. Didn't he? He said, wash the pot on the inside. The Lord will take care of the outside. All right. Therefore, they were seeking for Jesus and were saying to one another as they stood in the temple, what do you think? They will not come to the feast at all. Is he going to come to the feast? Is he going to come to the feast? You know, this is something we have to do. We have to go to this feast. You know, This is absolutely religiously necessary. Religiously necessary. He's got to come to the feast. He's got to cleanse himself. This is, uh, this is the Hasidor. This is the uh, Passover. You know, this is remembering all of this. You know, when, when... Now, did the death angel pass over Egypt? He didn't. He didn't. Who passed over Egypt? Jehovah himself passed over Egypt. Now, here we have Jehovah in the flesh. Jesus means who? What does his name mean? Huh? Jehovah saves. What does Jehovah mean? Who who shall become. Now, here he is. He's there. Now, they're wondering if he's going to come to the feast because this is mandatory. Mandatory. Now the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that if anyone knew where he was, they should report it, that they might seize him, snatch him. They're going to snatch him, seize him, to murder him. Now let's go to the 12th chapter. We've got a few more minutes left. The 12th chapter of the Gospel according to John. Mary anoints Jesus. Jesus, therefore, six days before the Passover came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Now, this is after the resurrection, isn't it? Remember what I told you where Jesus stayed a lot? With Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. So they made a supper for him there, and Martha was serving, but Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. All right? And Mary, therefore, took a pound of very costly perfume and pure pinard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair and the house was filled with fragrance of the perfume. There we have another woman. Another one. Anointing his feet. And this here is was some very, very expensive stuff. This is he he has been anointed now. Remember he was anointed by two Marys. Now we got this Mary. Now this Mary here is going to anoint anoint him not with her hair and with her tears, but with what? These very expensive burial spices. And this is the thing that they were buried with. Now remember Mary before had done what? She had taken her cloth that she was going to be buried with. She took her tears, she poured them out on his feet, and, and she cried and she worshipped him. Now, she's going to be preparing for his burial. The spices and the ointments and the perfume that she was going to be buried with, remember, he was going to be buried, she was going to be buried with her cloth and with her tears in the tear bottle. Now she threw all that away. Now she's going to take that which she's laid aside all of her life to be buried with the, the uh, embalming spices, so to speak, all right, and perfume. And she took a very pound of very costly perfume of pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair and the house was filled with the fragments of the perfume. This girl's, boy, she's really dedicated, isn't she? Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples who was intending to betray him, actually he just kept on betraying him. He kept on trying to find where he could betray him and, and, and sneak. He was a sneak. He was a Sakari. Remember what sort of Sakari mean? Assassin. Assassin. All right. Was not this perfume not sold for 300 denarii? How much is 300 denarii? How much is 300 denarii? 
What is a denarii? What's, how much is a denarii? Do you know what a denarii is, young lady? A week's pay? A day's wages. A denarii is a day's wages. That's a whole day's work, you know. A whole day's work. 300 denarii. Man, 300 days wages. Look at that. 300 days. This is, this is a lot of money. Okay, this is a lot. This is about 11 months wages at least, if, mu if not more. Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Who was the poor that he was thinking about? Himself. Because he kept on robbing the treasury of the church. The church was already in existence, okay? He called it out. They already had a treasure which was Judas Issachariot. What does Judas Issachariot mean? What does Judas mean? It should be what? What should his name be? Not Judas, but what? Judah. Yehuda, which means what? Praise Jehovah. Okay. Issacharyot. Issacharyot. What's that mean? Man from Karyot, which was down by Hebron. Okay. This is where he came from. Came from down there where those giants were at one time. Given to the poor. Now he said this not because he was concerned about the poor, but because he was what? A kleptomaniac. That's where the word comes right out of Greek. He was a, he was a thief. And he had the money box. He was a treasurer of the church. And he used to do what? I wasn't lying a while ago when I told you that story, was I? What did he used to do? He used to steal. He used to pilfer. 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 You know, some people can't walk in the store without trying to stick something in their pocket. Did you know that? Like old Judas Issachar, they're kleptomaniacs. He was a thief. You know why he was a thief? Now the law said, thou shalt not keep on stealing. Did uh, Judas keep on stealing? Yeah, he did. Did he keep on planning? Did he keep on bearing false witness? It says you shall not bear false witness in King James, but in the Hebrew it says you shall not keep on doing that. Did he keep on doing all these things? Did he keep on lying? Did he keep on wanting to murder? Did he keep on stealing? He was breaking all the laws, and yet he was a zealot in the... Jewish society. He was a Sakari. These were the assassins that went out and killed the Roman soldiers. These are the assassins that inhabited the Herodian palace out there at Masada. Because of these Jewish assassins is why Israel would be ravaged and brought down to the ground. Jesus looked at Israel or Jerusalem from Mount of Olives and looked over and said, Oh, Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem, how many times I would have called you like a mother hen does her baby chickens. And if you've ever been out on my place out there and you see a mama hen with her baby chickens, the mama hen will go, <coughs> and they will just go come right in. But Jesus said, You wouldn't come. You would not come. You didn't have enough, as much sense as a baby chicken. He used to pilfer the box. Verse number seven now. And Jesus said, therefore, let her alone in order that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. Verse number 9 now. The great multitude, therefore, the Jews learned that he was there. And they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus. This was a super miracle now. This was on the last super miracles that Jesus is going to do. All right. whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests took counsel that they might put Lazarus to death also. Kill the evidence. See there, he didn't, he didn't keep him alive. Now, I know people have asked me, I was going to ask you if you have any questions. And one of the questions might come out of your mouth right now, did Lazarus die again? Did, how many of you have had that idea? All right, did Lazarus have to die again? We don't know. <laughs> All we know is that Lazarus uh, was raised from the dead. Whether he had to go ahead and die and, and go back up to paradise later, we don't know. Maybe he was one of those that Jesus took with him to heaven. Because on account of him, many Jews were going away and were believing in Jesus. Do you have any questions? Yes. Yes. Where did 
did Lazarus go for those four days? Where did he go? Yeah, where did he go? He was in paradise. Okay. So he was in Abraham's bosom. Okay, that's what I figured. So mm-hmm. then so then the next question is you hear about these people and it's becoming very prevalent nowadays. These people that have died and have these visions gone to heaven. I don't believe that. I don't but this is what they use. Yeah. They use this as their as their proof that this is true. That these people that have had these out of body experiences that they were clinically dead and they say they've gone to heaven and they've come back, they use this as their proof. Yeah. How long did they did they start stinking? Did anybody ever come out of the grave? This this here is long division people. Right. The this man was dead dead. He was dead and buried. They'd watched after him for three days. He probably was beginning to smell. Okay? His body was deteriorating, and the Lord brought him back. We don't have anybody like that. We've got somebody still in the operating room, all of this other stuff, and we got them coming back. Yeah. Yeah, I've been there. <laughs> yeah, this, this is a whole different story now. But this is, this man was raised from the dead. What, what did, in Luke, the 16th chapter, what did the rich man say to Abraham this is an experience right out of paradise or Abraham's bosom or Sheol or Hades what did he ask last or what did he ask Abraham he said please I have five brothers left behind I love them please send somebody back from the dead so they will believe if somebody comes back from the dead and what did Abraham say he said, they have the what? The they have the prophets and the law. If they don't believe the prophets and the law, forget it. Most of these people that you'll find out wrote these books and stuff, this was fabrication. They made a lot of money doing this. All right. But Lazarus was really raised from the dead. Did it help a lot of these uh, Pharisees? No, it didn't do them one bit of good, did it? They didn't want to believe. They didn't want to believe. They just would not believe. All right. But he was, this was a miracle, an absolute miracle, all right? Any other questions? No? All right. I don't even have anybody to do the prayer request. Uh, Do you have the prayer thing? Let me shut this off.